Okay, I think we are live right now. Um, so, hello everyone. Uh, we are uh, Internet Falsafe Dags from Turkey. Uh, we are a, a, an analytic philosophy uh, magazine based uh, in Ankara. Uh, and we are with uh, two uh, great uh, thinkers and philosophers. Uh, one of them is Donald Robertson, uh, who is a, a psychotherapist with an ex especially philosophical orientation. Uh, and uh, the other one is Tufan Klimas, uh, who is also one of my professors in Bilkent University. And I am saying welcome to all of them. Uh, and we are going to start uh, one or two minutes later. Uh, and I want to mention that this is our uh, first ever English live stream. So there might be some uh, technical difficulties and other stuff. But uh, I hope we are going to have uh, an enjoyable uh, discussion uh, with uh, both uh, persons. Um, so um, we uh, actually gave uh, the uh, detailed uh, uh, introduction uh, in the description. So we are just going to get in the topic. Um, so what exactly is uh, this is targeted to all of you, uh, as, uh, of course. What exactly is this uh, stoicism and especially how uh, does ancient and modern stoicism differ or uh, interact with? Yeah. Well, thank you very much, first of all, for the introduction, Bera. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here uh, speaking with Tufan. And you know, I think what I'd like to say is maybe we could divide that question into perhaps three questions. One is for those of your viewers who are familiar with Stoicism, maybe we should say a little bit about who the Stoics are and their place in history. And then maybe a little bit about what they believed and then come to the, the other part of your question, which is how does ancient Stoicism perhaps relate to, to modern Stoicism? Um, so I'll say a little bit about the first question and then maybe I can hand over to Tufan and see if he has any, a, anything to add or any comments about that. Um, so Stoicism is a, an ancient Greek uh, school of philosophy, or we say that, but really it was founded by a Phoenician merchant um, from Cyprus, from Citium, who was shipwrecked uh, near Athens at the port of Piraeus. And he studied philosophy there for several decades, a couple of decades. And then in 301 BC, he founded uh, the Stoic school at Athens and it became established and associated with Athens. But the Athenians always viewed Stoicism as a foreign uh, philosophy, actually. They, they often comment on that. Um, and Zeno was influenced. He didn't appear from nowhere. He was influenced by preceding philosophical traditions. So he trained in uh, cynicism. He was a follower of Crates of Thebes, the cynic. And uh, he also studied at the academy. Uh, the, he studied Platonic philosophy at the, at the academy. And he read Xenophon's Socratic dialogues. He read Plato's Socratic dialogues. We know he also wrote a book about Pythagoras and the Stoics seem very influenced by Pythagoras as well. And he also studied in a less well-known school of philosophy, which was very influential at the time, called the Megarian School of Philosophy, which has some similarities to Stoicism and specialised in uh, dialectic or logic. They don't say so much about the influence of Aristotle, um, the, the sources that we have anyway on Stoicism, interestingly. But the figure that most influenced the Stoics, I think, was Socrates. And if we look at the later Stoics, we can see that they often hold Socrates up as their supreme role model alongside Diogenes, the, the cynic, actually. So those are the kind of influences on Stoicism. Um, Stoicism flourished for five centuries, and we only really have fragments from the early Stoics that survive today, unfortunately. But the Romans loved Stoicism. Of all the schools of Greek philosophy, Stoicism is the one that perhaps appealed to Romans the most. It resonated with their kind of militaristic uh, ethos and values, perhaps. And uh, the main writings that survive today, not the only writings, but the best known ones, come from three Stoics of the Roman imperial period. So Seneca, the younger, who is a, a rhetorician and a tutor to the emperor Nero, 
Epictetus, who was a freed slave, who became, I think, the most influential teacher of philosophy in Roman history, actually. And then Marcus Aurelius, who many people will know as, uh, because he was a famous Roman emperor, it was a big deal back in the day. And Marcus died in 180 AD. He was the last famous Stoic of antiquity. We don't hear much about Stoicism after that. And that's a period of just under 500 years or five centuries in Greece and in Rome and in other parts of the world where, where Stoicism flourished. And then arguably Stoicism continued to have some influence on early Christianity. Um, and its influence is still found today kind of and little traces permeating uh, Western culture. So that's what I would say about who the Stoics were in a nutshell and where they came from. And I, and I guess an honourable mention should also go to Cicero, who was not technically a Stoic. He was a follower of the academic school of philosophy, but he happens to be one of our main sources for Stoic ideas because he admired the Stoics and, and was very interested in their thinking, although he also had some criticisms of them. So I thought it'd be useful to begin with a kind of potted history of who these guys actually are before we dig into what they said and what they did. Um, and I wonder if Tufan has any thoughts about, about the Stoics and who they were and, and their place in history. No, uh, no, actually. So the, may, maybe we can also mention the Neo-Stoics, maybe, uh, the, the Christian. But but I think you are coming to the more modern Stoics. So this was just ancient and uh, all right. No, you can go ahead, actually, yeah. After the Renaissance, there was a, a resurgence of interest in, uh, in Stoicism um, and then a number of modern authors. And during the uh, Enlightenment period, there are authors who have a kind of ambiguous relationship to Stoicism that are well known. So Descartes, for instance, seems in the, the discourse on method to, to be influenced by the Stoics. He really talks about how he applies philosophy to his personal life. And Spinoza, although I don't think he mentions the Stoics at all, has sometimes been called more Stoic than the Stoics. Like his philosophy um, seems to resonate with Stoicism, seems to very similar to it. And so we can find traces of Stoicism in other modern authors, but there are a number. Um, so for example, there are the Neo-Stoics and in, in England, uh, the Earl of Shaftesbury uh, is an English philosopher in the, what, 16th, 17th century, um, actually wrote his own version of the meditations of Marcus Aurelius and was very explicitly influenced by Stoicism. Um, and so, so were a number of well-known uh, early modern authors. But uh, what did the Stoics believe? I guess we should get to the heart of their philosophy then. Well, you know, the Stoics actually defined their philosophy as having a central principle, which... Uh, you know, one way of distinguishing between ancient schools of philosophy is in terms of their definition of the telos or the goal of life. It's similar to what, in a sense, we might mean by talking about the meaning of life today. Um, so the main thing, the most important thing, the goal of life for the Stoics is arete or virtue. And uh, by that, they mean actually a kind of moral wisdom, in a sense. They have an intellectual model of virtue. So you could also say that it's moral wisdom that's the goal of life for, for the Stoics. And that's very much in the Socratic tradition. We can see that as being very closely tied up with what Socrates says about having a, a philosophy of life. And uh, the Stoics also had a number of synonyms for arete, which helped to kind of explain and round off their, their picture of the goal of life. So they most commonly describe their goal as living in agreement with nature. And by that, they mean not animal nature, but man's unique intellectual nature, what they saw as being distinctive about human beings. So living in accord with reason or living rationally is also how they define the goal of life. And again, we can see that as being synonymous with living wisely. And they also describe it as living honorably, or living virtuously. So these are various ways that they articulate their goal. It's a kind of moral wisdom that the Stoics think the main consequence uh, of which is that we develop psychological resilience because Stoicism is fundamentally a virtue ethic, but it's a, a virtue ethic, a moral worldview that has obvious psychological implications. So somebody who, like the Stoics, believes that virtue is the only true good, this kind of Stoic hard line. So other schools of ancient philosophy held similar positions in saying that virtue is the most important good. 
But the Stoics went even further than that and said it's the only true good. This very hard line that the Stoics adopt means that they are relatively indifferent towards the deprivation or loss of external goods like health, wealth, and reputation. And someone like the Stoic sage or wise man who's not uh, perturbed about the loss of these external goods and values his own character, his own possession of virtue and moral wisdom more, you'd think is gonna be more emotionally resilient in the face of adversity. And we'll come to this later, but that, that's partly why stoicism is so popular with psychotherapists like yours truly today who are interested in its, uh, its potential as a, a form of training in psychological resilience. Yeah, so, so one, one thing there though, um, so this, there, when they say virtue is the most important and maybe the only important thing, right? But it is not like, it is the only intrinsically valuable thing and we need to maximize it like utilitarian sense, like so we, we according to, for example, classical utilitarians, what is intrinsically valuable is happiness. So we should maximize happiness, right? Uh, but when the Stoics said virtue is the, chief good, right? Uh, so that is not really intrinsically valuable. So that in the sense, in the like utilitarian hedonistic sense. Um, so for example, in order to maximize my virtue, I cannot do a bad thing. So let's assume doing so, let's assume there is a book, right? And then if I read that book, then I will be a very virtuous person. It will really help me to become virtuous. If virtue is the only intrinsically good thing, so then I need to steal the book because then I will become virtues when I read the book. However, I think they wouldn't agree with that because it is more like when they say virtue is the only important thing, it is more like living virtuously every moment, right? Yes. Can we understand it that way? Yes. They describe it actually, sometimes they describe the goal of life as living wisely or living virtuously. Mm -hmm. Or like this, their main definition is living in agreement with nature. Mm -hmm. So I, I, I think so. Um, and another aspect of that, I, I, I would mention is this for the Stoics, the goal of life also seems to be about living consistently. Mm -hmm. They talk about the constancy or consistency of the Stoic sage. And as an intro, as an aside, like maybe this contributes to our discussion, I, I really think that's related to the very concept of the Socratic method, because I don't think it's a coincidence that mm -hmm. the Socratic method of questioning, by its very nature, is designed to expose contradictions mm -hmm. or inconsistencies in our thinking and also inconsistencies between our, our beliefs and our behavior. So I think somebody who goes through the Socratic method of questioning and really analyzes themselves, examines their character in this way, would have a more consistent worldview and would be free from hypocrisy and act more consistently in accord with their beliefs. So they would live consistently in accord with virtue, which I think is- uh, uh, And that uh, leaves the cognitive dissonance, right? Uh, and uh, the cognitive dissonance is actually uh, probably the most, one of the most uh, uh, bad feelings that one can feel, <laughs> right? Uh, so uh, when you, for example, uh, think through uh, some moral issues you think uh, about, and when you try to make your uh, moral worldview uh, coherent, uh, there are sometimes, and uh, you, uh, usually it is for nearly everyone, uh, tensions like uh, you are thinking about abortion, veganism, and so on, and you realize some of your basic assumptions uh, either uh, support these views and you don't want them to support these views, uh, them to support these views, or they oppose these views, but you don't want them. So you have to choose between some basic assumptions and make the most coherent whole in a sense. So Socratic method or when done at individual level, it might be seen as reflective equilibrium, the process of reflective equilibrium. Mm -hmm. That is a very interesting thing. And also some philosophers, um, actually uh, objected to utilitarianism uh, on the ground of integrity and living according to your own uh, views and your own personality and so on. Uh, so one of them is that if you have to maximize happiness uh, in all circumstances, in all 
uh, all of your actions, uh, what happens to your own personality or life projects. You have to betray yourself in every second you have to sacrifice, for example, your own projects for someone else's happiness. Mm -hmm. uh, so that might be uh, one very interesting uh, connection to uh, utilitarianism or mm -hmm. anti-utilitarian uh, philosophers and uh, stoicism. And that actually brings me to a very interesting question that some people uh, see Stoicism and virtue ethics in general too self-centered, right? Uh, it it has some egoistic um, connotations uh, to them, uh, and because you only focus on yourself, on your character, if your character is not harmed, uh, everything is okay, everything is fine. Uh, is that a correct way to look at uh, stoicism, or there is something wrong with it? I think this is a good question, actually. I can answer this. I, I feel like saying I could answer this in a sort of slightly more superficial, but maybe a useful way. And then maybe Tufan could dig a little bit more into the, the, the meta ethics of it or whatever the, the, the philosophical uh, ethics of it. So just as a very simple observation, there are, and this brings us into talking about modern stoicism a bit as well. So I think a lot of people who are interested in stoicism today see it in an instrumental way as a form of self-help about developing psychological resilience. And there's also pushback against that from within the stoic community, from other people who say, well, you guys are, are treating stoicism in a more self-centered way. You're not really acknowledging the, the role of social virtue, for example, cosmopolitan ethics in stoicism. And I, it always strikes me as odd the, the most popular book on Stoicism, most popular classic, is without doubt The Meditations of Marcus Aurelius. And that happens to be the Stoic text, uh, it seems to me, that places by far the most emphasis, um, probably because of his role as emperor, on justice and uh, natural affection and uh, harmony with the rest of mankind and these kind of social aspects of Stoic ethics. And so the Stoics have this idea derived from Plato or Socrates or Greek culture in general of what we now call the four cardinal virtues, wisdom, justice, courage, and temperance. And uh, justice and, and wisdom are, are in a sense the two more fundamental ones. Courage and self-discipline are what we need in order to deal with fear and desire so that we can act more consistently in accord with wisdom and justice. And in a sense, justice is moral wisdom applied to our interpersonal life, our relationship both with individuals and with society uh, as a whole, uh, with, with people collectively. But in the meditations of Marcus Aurelius, it seems to me that almost on, ev on virtually every page of that book, he makes some kind of reference either to social, pro-social feelings, uh, such as kindness and compassion and natural affection and so on, or to, to pro-social virtues like justice and fairness and so on, or cosmopolitanism. And, you know, it surprises me that someone can read the whole book. There's a saying by the English poet William Blake that says, we both read the Bible day and night, but you read black where I read white. And it seems to me it's amazing that people could read the meditations of Marcus Aurelius and take away from it this kind of atomistic, individualist, self-centered ethic, which is seems to me the opposite of what he's actually saying in that book. Um, we're told Marcus Aurelius incidentally built a temple to beneficence by the Roman historians. So, you know, doing good to others. Um, and that's a theme that runs out through the, the whole of the meditations. So I, I think there's certainly right if all the way back to Zeno, um, there's this pro-social aspect. So to live virtuously wouldn't just mean working on your own character in a self-centered way. It would mean developing your own character in a way that improves th your interaction with society and other individuals. So just with those observations about the literature, I think I'd hand it over to Tufan to maybe say a little bit more about the the philosophy behind that. Yeah. I mean, so the, the, the example I give is, it's like a tree, right? So if, so the, the tree gives fruits and it is good for people, uh, but the way you actually get the fruit from the tree is not just, you know, you, you don't pull the uh, fruits, but you care about the tree, right? You, you give water to the tree. So it's like the person's character. So if you look after your character, if you really, uh, you know, work on your character, then you will again like give fruit to people, right? So you will you will be actually contribute to the world. 
And I totally agree that in uh, in the uh, meditations, it is very clear that I think uh, Marcus Aurelius rejects that dichotomy between egoism and altruism, right? It is the, it's the, the same kind of thing. So he gives this uh, analogy of a body, right? We are like organs in the body. So there is this body that we belong and we are like organs. And, you know, think about it. Um, what is good for heart is also good for the body, the health of the heart and the health of the body. Uh, they are, you, you, you cannot, uh, you know, um, separate those from each other. The, the, what is good for the body is good for the heart. What is good for the heart is good for the body. So there is no dichotomy. There is no, you cannot, you, there is no, in, in good health, there is no, you know, benefiting heart without benefiting the, or maybe by harming the body, right? You cannot benefit the heart by harming the body. So that organic kind of relationship between the individual and the society and then the uh, universe, actually. Maybe we can talk about that their pantheistic uh, part, uh, beliefs too, when we talk yeah. about, for example, modern stoicism. But I totally agree. You know, I, I think it is very obvious in the meditations that there is no dichotomy like that. Yeah. Uh, there is also one interesting thing uh, that uh, in the stoic community, uh, there is also uh, another side to this uh, uh, that some people, some ultra nationalistic, ultra right wing people who actually really like Stoic philosophy. They, they claim that, but they completely uh, close their eyes to cosmopolitan uh, stuff in Marcus Aurelius and so on. Uh, and the other side is uh, Silicon Valley Stoicism, Stoicism, as you might, you, you call it, I think. Uh, and that's really strange. And uh, the strangest part is, I think, the ultra-nationalistic uh, wing to it because, well, uh, they claim to uh, appreciate the philosophy behind stoicism and not that it is just a uh, tool to achieve their goals uh, for these people. But uh, but clearly they uh, either didn't read the meditations or skip the parts uh, about cosmopolitanism. Yeah. I'd like to just comment about that briefly. I mean, just in terms of the, the stoic community, I know that some people have talked about, the journalists have written articles about this link between uh, the alt-right and ultra-nationalism and then interest in stoicism. And personally, although I've got a great overview of stoicism for 25 years now, I've been involved in all these communities, I haven't actually seen that much of that. Um, I've seen it a little bit, but not a lot. But it maybe, nevertheless, it is out there somewhere or another forums perhaps um, but in the main stoic forums we don't we don't really see very very much of, of these extreme uh, right-wing you know political uh, views usually th that is seen in uh, anonymous twitter accounts and so on uh, and these people actually are hooked to uh, the uh, ancient aesthetics uh, aesthetic part of it and um, it seems like that they don't engage with uh, ideas but they they just uh, drop some quotes and yes. share some pictures with uh, good-looking uh, statues. And so on. Yeah, I, kinda, I, I get that. That, that I get kind that. of community, but uh, we, we don't see them in mainstream stoic communities. Interesting. No, not as much. I mean, a tiny bit, but not not very much. Um, you know what I would say about it? My gut reaction, and I have spoke to some people that hold quite extreme uh, political views. The it, it, it really, it seems to me a, a good thing that they're interested in stoicism because immediately what I found in the past, it gives me something I can talk to them about. Whereas otherwise I, I might find it hard to really get into a dialogue with them. And, and often I find that if I can get talking to them about their appreciation of stoicism, although it might be very superficial, it might even be perhaps quite wrongheaded at first, like, it, nevertheless, it kind of gives us a thread that we can start pulling, like, and we can get them to talk about things Socratically and examine, as we were saying earlier, possible contradictions in their worldview. And I've seen people change and yeah. begin to reevaluate some of their more extreme positions, like, because we got into a discussion about Marcus Aurelius or, or Stoicism. Yeah, I, I think it's a good thing because they, they, they are clearly in search of something, you know, like a purpose of life. And, and then they are also... Uh, they also search those things in philosophy. So these are all good things, are the good steps, you know, maybe first steps, yeah. Right. 
so uh, another topic I want to, to discuss was uh, about uh, your other profession, uh, psychotherapy. Um, and uh, in your book about uh, the philosophy of cognitive behavioral therapy, you actually discuss uh, at length about the history behind this thing, uh, this interaction between therapy and philosophy. Mm -hmm. uh, but um, I want to uh, discuss some uh, rather practical issues about uh, the relationship between stoicism and uh, psychotherapy. Uh, for example, uh, most uh, psychotherapists have no background in philosophy, I guess, and uh, most philosophers have no background in uh, psychotherapy uh, as well. So uh, what do you think uh, a psychotherapist uh, gains from engaging with uh, uh, Stoic philosophy and other, maybe other uh, schools of ancient philosophy? Gosh, they gain, I think they potentially gain a lot. And it, it is actually unusual for psychotherapists increasingly these days. Actually, in the past, the psychoanalysts and, and early 20th century um, psychotherapists were, were perhaps more into classics and, uh, you know, more a little bit more into philosophy. And then there were some psychotherapists who were influenced by existentialism and phenomenology. Um, but that never really became a major mainstream approach to, to psychotherapy in practice. Um, it was kind of always a little bit more of a niche thing. But modern cognitive behavioral therapists, I think, perhaps feel that they don't have as much time to read um, other types of literature because they have to spend a lot of time reading uh, research studies. And, uh, you know, like there's more pressure on them to stay up to date with the latest research studies. So I think that kind of uh, competes a bit with them going off and, and reading things like the Stoics. I'm surprised because cognitive behavioral therapy is originally inspired by Stoicism. And when I first came to it, uh, I saw in every book on CBT, they quoted Epictetus. It's not things that upset us, but rather our opinions about them. And I thought, oh, cool. These psychotherapists are all into Stoicism like me. So we're going to have lots of cool conversations about Stoicism. But then I realized that was the only quote that they knew from any of the Stoics. And I thought, wow, like they've never gone and read Epictetus like, or any of the other stuff. So there are some exceptions, but, but often modern psychotherapists don't really delve that deep into it. And I think they, they would benefit a lot from doing so. What would they gain? Well, in the philosophy of CBT, I said that one of the things they gain is that, um, and in a way, this is a consequence of industrialization and the division of labor, incidentally. So psychotherapists, psychotherapy is a job. Like, whereas in the past, there has always been psychotherapy. The, the ancient Greeks um, talk about therapia. Uh, Chrysippus, the third head of the Stoic school, wrote a famous book called On Therapeutics. So we've always had, actually, quite explicitly had psychotherapy, therapy of the psyche. But it was something that philosophers did or that was kind of people who are interested in philosophy, you know, drew from philosophy. It wasn't like a really a separate vocation in the way that it is today. And what we've lost by separating psychotherapy is a sense of how things like CBT could be bigger and broader in scope. So I say stoicism is for life, it's not just for Christmas. CBT is meant to be time limited and goal directed. You go and see a therapist, for a few months, and then you stop. Like once you've, you know, achieved your outcomes, you're kind of, you pop out into the world, like come out the other end of therapy, like out of a, a sausage out of a sausage factory, you know, and now you're done with the therapy. But of course, people who benefit from CBT think, well, there's some really profound insights and ideas that I've taken from this. And often clients are left thinking, shouldn't I somehow be applying this to life in general? If only there was a philosophy of life that was based on similar psychological insights. And of course, if you took CBT and turned it into a philosophy of life, I don't know if you'd end up with ancient Stoicism, but you, you'd end up with something that's pretty similar. So what Stoicism brings is something that's, that's to put it very simply, what I'm saying is, you know, therapy is therapy and philosophy is philosophy. Like Stoicism is bigger in scope. It changes your whole personality for the rest of your life, kind of in the way that perhaps a religion like Buddhism might. Mm. Um, whereas cognitive therapy is inherently more limited in scope, but people are left wanting more 
from it. And so that's why their you know, stoicism in part is going through a renaissance in, in popularity, I think. And there are also concepts and techniques that we can learn from ancient philosophy. Because cognitive therapy is cognitive, it helps clients to identify inconsistencies and errors in their thinking. Well, you know, funnily enough, that's what logic does. And that's what the study of uh, informal fallacies, for example, in, in philosophy does. There's, a, there's an overlap between rhetoric and philosophy, logic, and cognitive therapy. And we mentioned earlier that the Socratic method itself, in a sense, is a, a kind of cognitive therapy. So there are things that therapists, I think, can learn from the type of questioning techniques and the study of fallacies, the study of logic, and so on, and also the study of rhetoric, actually, um, that might benefit their clients. Um, those are some of the reasons that I think psychotherapists should go back and, and read the classics. Oh, and one more thing. And I put this almost like a, a, a half joking. Um, I've never met anybody to this day, and I've thrown the gauntlet down many times, I've put this challenge in public. I've yet to meet anyone that actually has a cognitive therapy tattoo, right? But people send me photographs of their Marcus Aurelius tattoos yeah. all the time, right? So stoicism, people tell me they read the meditations. They're still reading it. 20, 30, 40 years later, like they read the Bible, it becomes like the Bible to them, like a scripture to them. And so they identify with it deeply. They say, I am a Stoic. They don't say, I am a cognitive therapy devotee. Like there's no word for that, right? Mm -hmm. So one of the reasons uh, the holy grail of mental health research would be what we call psychological resilience, by which we mean prevention. Prevention is better than cure. And CBT is a therapy. It treats people who already have a diagnosis. The, the problem's already happened. They already have clinical depression or clinical anxiety, but it'd be better if we could get to them before those problems occur and make them less likely to develop them, make more resilient in the first place. But to build resilience, you need to do something that's going to be long lasting or permanent. So psychologists are interested in this idea that stoicism might be sticky. Stoicism is sticky, by which they mean that when people learn about stoicism, they identify with it and remember it for the rest of their lives. So they, you know, they, they don't learn about it and then forget about it a year later and move on. If you want resilience, it needs to be longstanding or permanent. And stoicism has that appeal partly because the ideas are profound. And also perhaps, and this here's a current, maybe a contentious idea, a, a, an ironic observation about Stoicism. The Stoics are like Socrates are quite critical of sophists and of rhetoric. And yet, certainly Seneca and Marcus Seneca, arguably in a sense, was a sophist, a Latin sophist. He was a, certainly a rhetoric teacher. Some people would call him a Latin sophist. Marcus Aurelius spent decades training in rhetoric under some of the leading. Uh, figures in the second sophistic, like actual uh, uh, sophists in the Roman Empire. And so they're both highly accomplished orators and rhetoricians. And so it's no coincidence that the way they articulate their philosophy is highly evocative and highly memorable. And so people would get a quote from Marcus Aurelius tattooed on their arm um, because of their powerful use of language. So ironically, their familiarity with sophistry and rhetoric is one of the reasons that people love their philosophy today. So it's memorable, like, and profound, and uh, in a way that self-help books on CBT aren't. Um, these books, I mean, I'm sure there were lots of boring books on stoicism, written, and we know there were. We have fragments of some of them that are pretty dry to read, unless you're a, a kind of like us, like kind of nerds about history of philosophy and stuff like that. But we've got the most exciting books on stoicism. They're the ones that were curated for us by history. People preserve the meditations of Marcus Aurelius and the discourses of Epictetus because they're really cool and exciting to read. And so they survived for 2000 years for that reason. We've got the best of the bunch, arguably. And uh, so people identify with these in a way that they don't identify uh, with modern books on, on CBT. And that's of tremendous psychological value. Uh, I, I think that's exactly right. And uh, also, um... Having an underlying philosophy uh, when you apply certain uh, seemingly unconnected techniques uh, um, 
makes it something like your mindset uh, that uh, you naturally develop and un uh, not un not like some tool that you use when it is convenient to use. So uh, in that sense, I, uh, I think you're exactly right about the stickiness part that uh, it, it's sometime, uh, some, uh, after some time, uh, it becomes your personality in a sense. Uh, so uh, to, uh, do you have anything to add to Konoja? Yeah, very quickly, actually. So, um, so I was some. Sometimes people ask, "Well, we have psychotherapy now, right? We have scientific psychotherapy. So, why do we need, you know, stoicism?" Okay, it was based on stoicism, you know. Uh, maybe Albert Ellis, yeah, he okay, he was inspired by stoicism, but, but yeah. So, but I was thinking, I mean, ancient stoicism or this philosophies of life they are something completely different actually so psych from uh, psychotherapy and also maybe you can say more preemptive kind of measures about um psychological resilience emotive emotional resilience so for example maybe psychological counseling guidance not even that or life coaching right people are also doing life coaching so they are all different things and they do not capture what these philosophies have, and that is, I think, value, right? Value, what is what is valuable in life. So for example, you do life coaching, and then you help people use their potential to reach their own goals, to set their goals, and then reach their own goals. But Stoicism also say your goal should be, you know, your to uh, live uh, in agreement with your rational and social nature, and then the whole thing. So it is much more holistic. I think mm -hmm. that captures, and I think that holistic part uh, helps people identify with stoicism as I am a stoic, that, that kind of thing. So I, again, totally agree. Uh, and the, the more modern, uh, they are very useful, by the way, all this cycle, of course, right? However, they miss some, they, they do not capture everything that stoicism offers, I think. Mm -hmm. I think yeah. absolutely, you know, as a, a therapist, and again, I come back to this idea that stoicism is to a large extent, fundamentally uh, an ethical worldview. Mm -hmm. um, it's normative, it's meta-ethical, mm -hmm. and cognitive therapy isn't. Uh, cognitive therapy is thoroughly instrumental. Mm -hmm. Like It's a technique for achieving certain goals, but what happens if those goals are unhealthy? You know, and, but as a therapist, one of the things that we're arguing, I mean, this is a, a, a complex and, and a gray area, but at the edge of psychotherapy, where, where psychotherapy ends and philosophy begins, mm -hmm. it would be normative ethics and, uh, you know, the, the idea of what goals we should actually be pursuing. So therapists are not supposed to indoctrinate clients mm -hmm. into a particular worldview. So sometimes people say, what's it like? How do you do stoicism with clients in therapy? And the answer is, well, you don't really. That would be like saying, how do you do Christianity or how do you do Marxism with a client in therapy? You know, stoicism is a bunch of values. You can't indoctrinate the client into those values. What usually happens in this day and age is the clients will Google you and go, oh, this therapist writes books on stoicism. And then the client will ask you about it. You have a conversation that comes from the client. But if the client says they're not interested in stoic ethics, then you can't really start forcing it down their throat. So that there's a limit on what therapists are supposed to be doing with their clients when it comes to their fundamental values and goals. Um, then there's another argument, though, which is that uh, perhaps in some cases, if you encourage clients to engage in a process like reflective equilibrium and to, to reflect on inconsistencies, they might end up arriving at similar conclusions. The Stoics certainly would say, if you use the Socratic method, you'll end up agreeing with us. Why, once you've ironed out all the, the contradictions from your thinking, and actually in practice, I do think that that often tends to happen. Um, but there is this boundary that therapists are not meant to cross of imposing uh, teaching didactically uh, a moral worldview to, the, to their clients. And so stoicism outside of therapy, if clients happen to buy into and agree with virtue ethics, and particularly the stoic kind of hard line about virtue ethics, then it gives them something that's obviously of therapeutic value, but would lie outside the remit of conventional psychotherapy. When I first started doing stoicism, I realized in cognitive therapy, we say it's clients' beliefs that cause their uh, emotional disturbance. And so someone who's socially anxious might think, um, these people don't like me. 
Um, they think I'm an idiot. And uh, that might make them feel anxious, right? So a cognitive therapist might say, well, where's the evidence that all of these people think you're an idiot? But the Stoics might say, what difference does it make if they think you're an idiot? You know, maybe that's an external, it's not directly under your control. And what's more important is the use that you make of their attitude towards you and the, the way that they interact with you. The, what's perhaps more important is your own character and your own possession of, of virtue. So perhaps you're wrong to place so much value in these external things. Now, it seems to me self-evident that somebody like a Stoic sage who views other people's opinions of them in a detached way with relative indifference is going to be less susceptible to social anxiety for that very reason. So cognitive therapy potentially seems a bit more superficial in that sense, but it can't go where philosophy goes. It's prohibited from digging that deeply into our values in a sense. Although, you know, there may be, you know, it, that's a complex question actually, but in a sense, so philosophy, stoicism can dig deeper into our beliefs than cognitive therapy would, would normally be expected to. And in a way that seems self-evidently therapeutic. Mm -hmm. Actually, so, um, so as you said, the, the relationship between the uh, therapist and the patient is highly regulated, right? So, so there, are, there are lots of rules there. Um, so I really don't know much about the relationship between these great stoic teachers and their students. That, that's, that's a different kind of relation, right? So Epictetus, Mark, uh, Musonius Rufus, and their students. So can you say something about what was their... So when we say a stoic school, right, for example, are we talking about people sitting in the classrooms and listening to? Or what are we talking about? Well... Like we said, uh, we mentioned earlier that Stoicism went on for ages. It went on for like five centuries as an active thing. So in the early school, sure, they all went and sat in the Stoicoikale. And uh, although they didn't sit, actually, Zeno wouldn't allow them to sit down, incidentally. Mm. Like we're told he paced up and down because he really didn't want people kind of sitting. They, so they would gather around and they would listen to him uh, talking about philosophy. We don't know whether it was more didactic. It sounds like maybe they used a version of the Socratic method. Um, certainly Epictetus, we have these discourses. It looks like he's doing a combination of lecturing. And also we can see him um, in the first century AD doing the Socratic method with people that, that come to his school. But the, the Stoic school was a kind of semi-formal institution, largely based at the Stoicoikale mm -hmm. um, at the outset. And then um, after the dictator Sulla, uh, uh, besieged Athens, he destroyed some of the libraries and philosophical schools. From that point onwards, um, Stoicism seems to have become kind of uh, fragmented and there's no longer um, a single scholar or head of the school. So as an institution, it seems to have become decentralized in a way and perhaps teaching was less formal. But there, in addition to being like with Epictetus, we have a teacher and then a group of students where they're, they're doing something like a seminar or a debate. Um, we also seem to have individual mentors in Stoicism and maybe in other branches of ancient philosophy. So Junius Rusticus was a Roman statesman who was Marcus Aurelius's main Stoic teacher. And interestingly, in book one of the meditations, Marcus Aurelius says that he's grateful that Rusticus convinced him that he needed correction of his character and therapia. So he literally says that his main stoic teacher convinced him that he required some, some kind of therapy. Um, and it seems that that was a one-to-one -one, like relationship, maybe mm -hmm. a bit like confessional or mm -hmm. like the Socratic mm -hmm. method or like coaching or psychotherapy, mm -hmm. you know, but an ancient precursor of all these things. Incidentally, I believe this is one of the reasons that uh, ancient philosophy ran foul of Christianity because you, it would be problematic among many other things if you were going for a kind of confessional relationship with your philosophical mentor um, the, that would directly compete with the role of confession in, in early Christianity um, you can't be kind of discussing your moral weaknesses and confessing them and being examined you know by these two like uh, people representing opposing traditions um, so if you close down the philosophical schools, you become completely uh, dependent uh, for uh, moral self-examination on, on the clergy. Mm -hmm. okay. So uh, one thing I wanted to uh, talk about is uh, how you approach, for example, uh, 
patients who don't adopt any kind of moral worldview, amoralists, moral nihilists, and so on. Uh, uh, how, how should we uh, approach them? Because sometimes I think that uh, some of these people at least are not uh, receptive to uh, therapeutic uh, interventions, right? Because uh, their whole worldview is, or their whole mindset is uh, such that uh, there's nothing that can conceive them out of that, uh, right? Uh, I think that's, you're right in that's problematic. And it's a little bit of a psychologically complex question because I think many people that you would meet in everyday life who, um, I think most people, I think many people mistakenly assume that everyone has a conscience. Like, and I, I think it's a spectrum. Like some people have an overly active conscience. So for people who have obsessive compulsive disorder, often are very self-punitive, experience a lot of guilt um, and are, are, are quite really troubled by, by guilt over things that, that maybe they feel irrationally guilty or ne unnecessarily guilty about. The other end of the skill, sociopaths maybe have like no sense of conscience whatsoever. And maybe other people with certain types of personality disorders or mental health problems have a minimal uh, conscience. Now in psychotherapy, you might meet people who appear to have a negligible conscience but nevertheless, by working with them Socratically, you can get them to clarify their values and maybe act more consistently with pro-social values in a way. Although, again, the, the role of the, the therapist post-industrial revolution um, is limited in that regard. We can't teach them ethics. So I think a lot of people would say the therapist needs to accept that uh, if their client doesn't share similar pro-social values, the therapist's role is to help them with their anxiety and depression. Nevertheless, we do have codes of ethics, for example, that say that, you know, um, it would be a violation of ethics to uh, allow a client um, or for it to go unreported that uh, a client is doing something that endangers either themselves or other people usually is the exception that's made. Um, so there are kind of limits on the instrumentality of, of psychotherapy. You know, you couldn't help a sociopath overcome their anxiety so they can go out and do more sociopathic things that would be in breach of your, your code of ethics. Um, but there, there may be clients who have negligible um, sense of social uh, virtue or social values and, you know, your, your therapy is really just focused on, on helping them overcome their, their uh, feelings and not really guiding them towards a, a more cosmopolitan or, or pro-social view. And then that doesn't happen that often, but occasionally there may be a moral problem for the therapist. You know, uh, for example, you know, by helping somebody to become uh, a more resilient Nazi, you know, like uh, as your job in a sense should be to, to help the client regardless of their values, but there may be cases where your difference of values is so extreme the therapist would have to say, I, I don't feel it's appropriate for me to, to, to work with you. Um, you know, um, then what happens? The client seeks another therapist. I should say also that people who have an extreme lack of moral conscience would probably be more fall outside the remit of conventional psychotherapy. They're more likely um, to uh, require specialist help, maybe medication, um, and maybe treatment by a psychiatrist rather than a, a, a psychotherapist. So it's a little bit of a complicated question, but you're, you, the core of your question is absolutely spot on. This is a, a dilemma. Mm -hmm. um, so if Tufanuja does not have anything to add, uh, we might uh, start discussing about uh, some uh, common misconceptions about stoicism, like uh, stoicism means being emotionless and so on, uh, especially for our, some of our uh, followers, it might be valuable to discuss some kind, some misconceptions about stoicism. Uh, so uh, what do you think are the most common misconceptions? Let's start with the one that you just mentioned. Yeah. Like I'd say the root of it to me seems to be terminolo terminological. Now, I don't know about other languages like, like Turkish, for example, but in English, um, we sometimes use the word stoicism with a lowercase s to refer to an unemotional coping style, which people refer to as having a stiff upper lip. And technically, 
I would describe lowercase stoicism as repressing or concealing unpleasant, painful, or embarrassing emotions, basically. And that's tenuously related to capital S Stoicism, the ancient Greek school of philosophy. Now, first of all, it's obviously a much more simplistic concept. There's nothing more to lowercase Stoicism than just this idea. It's just, a, it's an, again, instrumental. It's just a way of dealing with your emotions. It's a very crude emotional coping strategy. And uh, it's, you could say it's kind of a caricature of what ancient Stoicism taught. Ancient Stoicism is all for complex philosophy, but it also has a much more nuanced view of emotion uh, than, the, than this kind of blunt instrument. Now, this is very important because there's actually a fairly large body of research on lowercase Stoicism. Um, and in fact, there was research on that first before we even began researching capitalized Stoicism. And we, we find pretty consistently from different teams of researchers working in different areas around the world that lowercase stoicism often, if not always, leads to greater emotional vulnerability, particularly over the longer term. So to put that another way, that's the opposite of emotional resilience. And actually, uh, uh, to highlight how significant that is, the paradox or the irony there Many people believe that having a stiff upper lip is a form of emotional resilience, when in fact the scientific research suggests it's the complete opposite, that people who try to suppress or conceal emotions very often, but not always, particularly over the longer term, and particularly if they're already experiencing diagnosable or clinical anxiety or depression, that it's likely to make them more vulnerable. Now, there are many reasons for that. But one very simple reason, I'll give you two of the main reasons. One is that people who do that typically don't seek social or professional support for their problems. So that would be like someone who's got a toothache and they're being stoical about it by having a stiff upper lip and they're just kind of like trying to ignore it like and tough it out and grin and bear it. Whereas somebody who's been more rational about it might go to the dentist and get their tooth pulled out or fixed, right? So people who kind of try and suppress emotions aren't really dealing with the underlying cause of the problem. That's obviously unhealthy and it gets more unhealthy as time passes and the underlying problem perhaps becomes more severe. Now, another more subtle problem with it is that um, we call this the paradox of thought suppression in psychology, that when someone really wants to get rid of a subjective feeling or a thought, it, it does a number of things psychologically, but one is that it usually encourages us to automatically allocate more attention to it. And that typically magnifies the thought or feeling and makes it more likely to recur in the future. So if you say to somebody in, in psychology departments, they'll say to students, try really hard not to think of a tiger. And imagine it's really dangerous to think of a tiger even for a split second. Now, not only will that immediately make you more likely to think of tigers in most cases, but you, in the hours and days that follow, you'll probably find yourself thinking about tigers because there's what we call a rebound effect. So people, for example, with obsessive compulsive disorder who think I must not think sinful or blasphemous thoughts, I must block them. It'd be terrible or catastrophic if I thought those often just tie themselves in knots and end up thinking about them even more. And clients with clinical depression or will often tell you they're trying really hard not to feel depressed or sad. But in doing that, they just make themselves feel even more depressed or, or sad. So lowercase stoicism um, is problematic on many levels, really. And also the research directly uh, shows that it, it causes more problems over the, the longer term. So therefore, it'd be really important not to mix these two things up because capitalist stoicism, to some extent, is the inspiration for cognitive therapy. There's huge volumes of research that show that cognitive therapy is on the right track in terms of mental health. So we'd be confusing something psychologically healthy with something psychologically unhealthy. Now, we uh, maybe Tufan can speak a little bit more to this perhaps, but just in terms of reviewing the literature, in, I, I would I acknowledge that in the, there's evidence that in the ancient world, the Stoics were perceived as preaching uh, uh, an unemotional philosophy. And they were criticized by other people. The Stoic, the sophist, 
Herodes Atticus, for example, we have a, 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 a quote from him where he attacks the Stoics for being unemotional like men of stone or statues. But there's also evidence that the Stoics directly rejected that and said that at the time that was a mischaracterization of what they were teaching. Now, in terms of the, the systematic side of their philosophy, the Stoics have a system for classif classifying emotions, which is actually quite sophisticated. They distinguish between healthy and unhealthy emotions and desires. And they even go further than that and distinguish the involuntary or automatic precursors of emotion, what they call the propathei, which is so really a much more nuanced view of emotion than, than many people have today. And the Stoics frequently refer to healthy passions, the eupathei. Um, so Marcus Aurelius talks a lot about natural affection, friendship, love, kindness, and so on. And actually, as an aside, the Stoics also thought that uh, not only pleasant emotions can be healthy, but also painful emotions can sometimes be healthy, such as the sting of conscious, conscience. And Epictetus actually talks most about painful, unhealthy emotions. So he says there's a healthy form of shame where we would be ashamed of acting foolishly or viciously and develop a kind of aversion uh, to doing those things. And he, he thinks that's uh, you know, a, a help, one of the healthy emotions, for instance. So the, the Stoic sage would not be a robot or as they put it, a statue. He would have a repertoire of healthy emotions, including cheerfulness, joy, friendship, affection, uh, predominantly those kind of things, and maybe a healthy feeling of aversion towards certain things. But there would also be many unhealthy, irrational or excessive emotions, which he, he would have cured himself of. I, I, think, I think it's an interesting phenomenon that, that these ancient philosophies, the lower, uh, the lower K, uh, cynicism, Epicureanism, Stoicism, they are all, you know, they, they, they do not match what these philosophies were. And maybe another um, general, very common misunderstanding uh, about Stoicism can be about the Stoic acceptance. Maybe you can say something about that too, because uh, so there is so sometimes people interpret Stoicism as like accepting what it is, what whatever is so the famous dichotomy of control, right? So uh, you should focus on the things that are in your control, and you shouldn't worry about the things that are not in your control. And we, we, maybe we can talk more in more detail about that. And then the kind of the accusation is. Um, then stoic accepting acceptance is just whatever is not in your control and what is in your control is your uh you know decisions and actions and all that then you should just accept them and you shouldn't try to change them mm -hmm. so, can so you well the first thing to say is that that wouldn't be much of a philosophy it wouldn't have lasted 500 years because it would lead to complete kind of passivity it would, be, it would be the philosophy of a doormat or a jellyfish or something like that i guess so you think well there's something that doesn't add up here because i'm pretty sure marcus aurelius commanded a massive army of 140,000 people yeah. in the roman frontier and you know the, these guys risked their lives uh, defying uh, tyrants there was a, a whole movement a whole faction in the senate called the stoic opposition uh, several of whom were famously martyred or executed opposing nero and domitian um, so these were guys that really stood up for their principles and risked their lives in doing so. And also, what happens to these virtues of uh, courage and self-discipline if the philosophy is just about being completely passive and inert? So one thing we can do is just point at the actual history of the philosophy and the figures, and we can see that, that they're really committed to taking a political stand often and not at all passive doormats that withdraw from society. Some philosophers did do that more. Now, controversially, like the, in the ancient world, actually the Epicureans were mm -hmm. seen advocating withdrawal from society more and the, the Stoics were, were known for advocating political engagement, engagement with public life more by contrast. They led to mm -hmm. different, often to different uh, politics and lifestyles. But uh, a good technical way of explaining this would be that in Epictetus, he talks about there being three Stoic disciplines, if you like, three branches of Stoicism. So there's a discipline of ascent, which has to do with psychology and logic. Um, there's a discipline of desire or the discipline of fear and desire, which has to do with what we call the therapy of the passions. Like, And that's a, this is the part of Stoicism that, that focuses on 
emotional acceptance um, of unpleasant or stressful situations. But there's also the discipline of action, which has to do with fulfilling our role in society and living in accord with the, the, the social virtues like justice, fairness and, and kindness mm -hmm. uh, and pursuing action with the reserve clause and so on. So mm -hmm. you could say, look, the Stoics do advocate emotional acceptance, but that's combined with disciplined and courageous action. So the discipline of desire is combined with, combined with the discipline of action. Um, to say that Stoicism is just kind of passive acceptance would be ignoring that whole branch of what the, the philosophy teaches. And so really, I could say this gets to the heart of Stoicism and actually it raises some interesting, perhaps even meta-ethical uh, questions about the Stoic teaching, which this idea that the Stoics technically refer to is that preferred indifference or a type of value that they call axia. Um, so the Stoics believe that we shouldn't place so much value on external things that we become perturbed or upset by them. But we can place a type of value on external things that allows us to choose between them and also to select them rationally. Now, there's an interesting discussion of this in Cicero's De Finibus. I mentioned earlier, I gave you a little bit of a heads up earlier and said Cicero was one of our main sources. And actually, Cicero is probably our best source for a systematic theoretical account of Stoic ethics. We get kind of fragments and more informal discussion in Epictetus, Seneca, and Marcus Aurelius. But we almost get a lecture on Stoic ethics mm. in Cicero's De Finibus. He puts it in the mouth of Cato the Younger, who he calls the complete Stoic, actually. And uh, what he says is, in the discussion, Cicero says to, say, to Cato, you guys preach indifference. So does that mean that you're just completely indifferent to everything? And funnily enough, he says, like, the, the followers of Piro of Elis, the, the skeptic, would be like that. Um, and also one of the, the, the people who broke away from Stoics, uh, Stoicism, Aristotelos, um, taught this, we're told this complete indifference to, to external things. And um, Cato says, not a chance. Mm -hmm. and, you know, I'm, I'm not saying what those guys are saying. You don't confuse us with them. Um, in fact, in order to have virtue, Cato goes as far as to say that virtue actually consists and being able to select rationally between external outcomes. So yes. although Stoics suspend the strong value judgment that might powerfully affect their emotions, nevertheless, they do assign a different sort of value to things. And if they didn't do that, uh, Cato says, look, not to do that and to treat everything as, as equal would be folly and it would be vicious and you wouldn't be able to act in accord with justice like if you were doing that, in fact. So it's integral, he seems to think, to Stoic ethics that mm -hmm. some kind of value is assigned to external things. Now, this arguably is the essential technical point of Stoicism. The Stoics want to say that we normally don't distinguish clearly between these different types of value, but in order to have a coherent and he healthy ethical worldview, it has to be grounded on some sort of distinction between these, at least these two different types of value. Yeah, I, I think I think it's like, so even if you just focus on, for example, you are driving a car and you are focusing on driving the car well, but you are supposed to drive it somewhere, right? So the, you need a direction and that direction is the preferred indifference, right? So I think when people uh, hear about this stoic acceptance, when they hear the, the term acceptance, so for example, what is the opposite of accepting something, right? So either it is, just leaving it as it is and not try to change. That is not what Stoics uh, believe. But another opposite of acceptance can be denying the reality, right? Just, just rejecting the, the facts. So that is not. So, so, so uh, the, the way I interpret this, the Stoic acceptance is accepting reality as it is with, with the potential and maybe potential to change and maybe with the um, obligation to change. Yes. Right, that is part of reality. So then you accept that, and then you try to change uh, as a preferred indifferent. But another, I think, very important part there is you try to change, you try to do just things, you try to you know uh, do something about injustices. But your uh, success or failure is determined by your action and your attempt, rather mm -hmm. than whether you can actually uh, achieve that goal that is 
external to you and that is not really a, a, um, a measure of your success because it is not dependent only on you but it's also the last word is not yours right when it comes to external world yeah whatever is what, what whatever is in your control that uh, actually determines your failure or success maybe we can understand that way. it's partly in the hands of fate mm-hmm. and in a way the stoics this is a bold claim to make but i think in, in their own eyes the stoics are simply advocating that we view life more realistically mm-hmm. so they they think we're all somewhat deluded i think it's fair to say they believe that we're all deluded Mm-hmm. Um, and assuming that we have control over things that we don't really control and neglecting mm-hmm. the control or responsibility that we have for things that we do control. Yeah. And uh, they think that often when we pursue action too passionately, we, we, we behave as if we had complete control over the outcome and we're lying to ourselves in a sense by doing that. So I still think we just need to be more brutally honest with ourselves about the limits of our, our sphere of control. Mm-hmm. And uh, you said quite rightly that the what is a good question to ask is what would be the opposite of acceptance? And that might be um, kind of struggling against things that aren't under your control. It might be denying reality. And it might also be complaining excessively about things or, you know, getting really, uh, the opposite of acceptance might be getting really upset about things unnecessarily, excessively upset about them or irrationally upset about them. Now, this brings us really to another Tough question, and, uh, and also interestingly, a difference from other ancient schools of philosophy. So the, a famous disagreement between the Stoics and the Aristotelians relates to the concept of anger. Mm-hmm. And uh, so the, Sto- the, the Aristotelians appear to believe that a moderate amount of justified or righteous anger is a, a healthy and a necessary part of life. And the Stoics, with some qualification, um, typically believe that anger is inherently irrational, and therefore, the, the, the sage would, would simply be free of it. Um, that again, they acknowledge that there are propathei or involuntary reflex-like feelings. So they they do acknowledge that the sage, if someone came up and spat in his face, would would naturally feel a flush of indignation or anger, but he wouldn't continue to act on that or escalate it um, necessarily because he would question whether the values and that he's, he'd be then imposing in the situation were rational or not. He, he wouldn't uh, believe that the, the behavior was intrinsically awful, for example. Um, so he would have a kind of more, uh, a somewhat more relaxed attitude to, towards the, the event. But uh, I think the, the core of this disagreement, which we still, it's one of these perennial debates that we still see being replayed today when people talk about stoicism. So the form it often takes is people say, you need anger sometimes to motivate you. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So it's what I call the motivational theory of anger. And the, the Stoics would disagree with that. So they would say, so someone might say, I, I'm not, I, I don't accept this situation. Like, and I need to get angry about it. And I need to kind of dispute it in order to have this fuel, this anger that I need to change things. And the Stoics want to say, no, your values can motivate you to take courageous and self-disciplined action without you having to have your temples throbbing without you having to have passionate anger. You don't need passions for motivation, they would say. I agree with them. But there are also many psychologists that uh, debate this from both perspectives today. And it is better to, you know, uh, do something because of your sense of justice or love or something like that, rather than with anger, right? Because then you can be actually more rational and more more efficient when you actually uh, intervene, yeah. Well, I'll say two things very briefly about this. I think the, the easiest way usually to, to illustrate the, the Stoic position is to say there's there's a great deal of modern research in psychology that shows that when people get angry, their, their brain is in a different mode of functioning. And in that mode of functioning, there are very typical, stereotypical cognitive biases that people mm-hmm. exhibit. So angry people typically underestimate risk. They typically find it difficult to empathize with or understand other people's positions. They often jump prematurely to conclusions about other people's motives, and they typically engage in overgeneralizations in their thinking. So we can list the typical thinking errors that go with anger. And once we do it as clinically as that, it seems obvious that being motivated by anger would be problematic. Now, I compare it, there's a meme on the internet that says, 
coffee. It's got a cup of coffee. It says, coffee, do stupid things quickly and with more energy. Now, that's how I see Aristotle's motivational theory of anger. Like, mm -hmm. anger helps you to do stupid things quickly and with more energy because you sacrifice reason when you get angry, even if it kind of, like, you know, gives you more fuel or something. And that's really one of the reasons why the, the Stoics see it as, a, as deeply problematic. Um, so uh, about that, maybe we can say we can distinguish between some kinds of uh, anger that some of them are more uh, cold and calculating in a sense, and some of them that are really yeah, hot anger and that uh, makes your uh, heart go pump blood and so on. And uh, maybe there is some sort of sweet spot there that does not uh affect your uh, judgments uh, that much i'm going to side with seneca here who says now first of all we're really getting into having to distinguish a kind of fine grained so some angles okay and other th this is getting harder and harder for the aristotelians right so immediately you might say well hang on a minute how can you be sure that it's the healthy cold type of anger and you're not kind of slipping into the seneca would say anger is notoriously a slippy slope um, when you speak to people who lost their temper and ended up in prison, for example, because they maybe did something excessive or violent, they'll often tell you that they started off feeling that they were in control of their anger, and then it escalated. So anger by its very nature deceives us in that regard. And so Seneca quite rightly says, you know, you know that anger is designed, like well, anger uh, intrinsically deceives you into thinking it's cooler and more under your control than it actually is. So we have to be wary of it for that reason. You know, oh, I'm not going to do the bad anger. I'm only doing the good anger. Like the, the But, you know, everyone who's ever gone crazy and done something uh, terrible as a result of anger started off thinking um, that they were in control of it. Yeah. Can we say a similar thing with about, or what do you think about uh, empathy? Because empathy can also have that kind of an effect, right? Because it can really uh, make you harder to be impartial, you know, and all that. However, a little bit empathy uh, is a good thing, you know? So, uh, so, but, but you say anger is a different thing. It's not like empathy. So it is, there is no, right? So what's the difference, do you think? I think I think they are slightly different concepts, but actually, and it's, I really like this question. It's what it's a good question. It's one that I haven't probably explored as much as I should have, especially as a therapist, because empathy is very important. This this question of empathy, or we would say in therapy, the distinction, for example, between sympathy and empathy, the mm. difference between agreeing with the client and understanding the client, mm -hmm. like there's a kind of fine line. It's and it's again, it's difficult. Like we a bit like we said with anger, you know, often you start off understanding someone and putting yourself in their shoes. And if you're not careful, you end up kind of almost being hypnotized by them and starting to kind of believe and agree with things that they are saying, thinking, or feeling, which might not actually be true or, or, or might not be the whole story mm -hmm. in some cases. Mm -hmm. As an aside, a little story, I, I, I had an unusual um, beginning to my career as a, a therapist. I was, uh, as a young man, I was a counsellor in high schools in South London. And what's unusual about that is the clients that I saw, um, mainly 15-year-old students, um, you know, many of them knew one another. Now, that, that's not typical in a normal therapy practice. And so I would see clients who told me, that they had been in a fight and they'd been picked on by a bully and I'd listen to and talk to them about it. And then maybe an hour later, I'd be talking to the person who did the bullying and I'd be listening to their perspective on the same event. And then later in the day, I'd maybe be talking to someone who observed it happening in the playground. And, and so I'd get completely different perspectives on the same event. And that alerted me to the, the, how easy it is to get hypnotized by the, the client's story, their version of events, and how wary is, how careful we have to be as therapists. As a supervisor of therapists over the years, I feel that very often I've seen novice therapists mm -hmm. much more than they realized buying into mm -hmm. and getting drawn into the, the, the client's story too much, not re remaining objective and impartial enough. Mm -hmm. um, it's a, it seems to be a, a, a natural weakness that we have uh, psychologically if we're not careful. Now, the Stoics were actually quite aware of this, and they have 
you could say, mixed feelings about empathy. So if you read the meditations of Marcus Aurelius, in a way it's puzzling because he, Marcus often talks about putting yourself in other people's shoes mm -hmm. and attempting to understand them, showing kindness towards other people as well and patiently listening to them. But he also says that you should view other people's opinions as trivial and unimportant to you and rely on your own judgment. Mm -hmm. So he, again, he, he really seems to express these mixed feelings about empathy and also the amount of time that we should spend being preoccupied with other people's opinions. Also, just as a kind of interesting historical aside to that, the way we think of the Roman emperor today, it's almost a misnomer, in fact. Like the, the, the Roman emperor isn't kind of an emperor in the way that we would typically think of it. And in part, like, like um, many statesmen in, uh, in ancient Rome, the, the emperor was a, a magistrate. Um, and throughout his career as emperor, Marcus was like a, I guess also in a way like a Supreme Court judge. Like, mm -hmm. and he had this job of um, adjudicating in, in, in legal hearings and, and trials. So Marcus, when he's talking about um, trying to understand other people's motives and so on, partly comes from this long-standing career of studying jurisprudence and serving mm -hmm. as a, a magistrate. It wasn't something that he could be dismissive about, you know, almost like a therapist. Part of his job was to interview people and try to, you know, understand what their motives were. And in the meditations, he talks about the uncertainty of that, how we can never be sure. You know, it's a matter of gauging probability what someone else is thinking. And so we, we, we have to be cautious of jumping prematurely to conclusions about what's going on in another person's mind. We almost like a skeptic philosopher. Like when it comes to other people's motives, we, we have to remain, suspend judgment. The Stoics believe it's, the, the Stoics think there are some things we can be certain about, unlike perhaps the skeptics, mm -hmm. but they think there's other parts of life that we have to uh, exercise a, a suspension of judgment about. We can't read other people's mm -hmm. minds, for example, and, and attempting to do so is uh, a very common source of anger and other psychological yeah. problems. But there's also an interesting passage in Epictetus where one of his students talks to him about, um, you know, what happens. I think the example they give is what happens if something really bad happens to your mother or a family friend, or, you know, should you be cold like a statue about it? And Epictetus gives a very famous, very paradoxical and intriguing response. He said, by all means, groan along with them. Mm -hmm in order to show empathy, he says, just don't groan inwardly. And mm -hmm. I, I always, that really resonates me as a, with as a therapist. So a therapist cannot sit there completely dispassionate where a client is talking about the anxiety or depression, even though the therapist may see that the client is worrying about something disproportionately or, 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 or something in the future that may never even happen. So in a sense, it's completely, it may be completely imaginary or unfounded. But the, the therapist can't seem too detached because um, it, it wouldn't be good rapport. Um, but the therapist also has to show empathy while remaining, in a sense, internally detached from the, the client's irrational emotions. And I, I'm astounded that the Stoics were smart enough to, to spot this uh, dilemma. Mm -hmm. So, so when, when, so for example, what someone sees another person suffering, right? So then they can feel their suffering uh, because we are social beings, as Stoic said. However, as Epictetus said, I, th I think they would say we shouldn't feel with your whole whole being, right? You shouldn't really become that person. You should help that person, maybe. Mm -hmm. uh, but if you really feel their pain like 100%, then you will not be able to help that person either, right? So that, that will not help. So I think the whole thing there is something like becoming a person, right? That's a very important part of Stoicism, right? So all these practices, becoming a person who does not need to get angry or who doesn't need to feel that much other person's, other people's pain in order to act. You just act rationally and based on uh, maybe a pathos and then... I get, absolutely agree. I think that's spot on. Oh, I should just mention as an aside, my other favorite analogy about anger in Barrett, this doesn't really speak to your idea of cold anger, but it does deal with the, the, the problem of hot anger, perhaps. Mm -hmm. And I know this example reaches a lot of people who, who, who might kind of struggle with this question. 
Now, sometimes people have said to me, well, what if you're in a fight and you have to defend yourself? Wouldn't mm -hmm. anger be helpful, right? Mm -hmm. And I say, well, actually, the, the pe good, good people to speak to about this would be martial artists or boxers. Mm -hmm. They'll often tell you that uh, not only can anger, in many cases, if not all, but certainly in many cases, anger can be quite unhelpful. So, for example, when someone's really in hot anger or rage, I mentioned earlier, they tend to underestimate risk. So with a boxer, that might mean that they punch too much and too hard and exhaust themselves prematurely in the fight. It might mean that in martial arts or boxing, they drop their guard and expose themselves to more punches. So when people are really angry, they might be attacking the other person, but also making themselves more vulnerable or making other people more vulnerable who perhaps are responsible for defending. So anger can, can be, you know, potentially quite dangerous and irrational, even in a a fight, you know, even in a conflict situation or in a martial art. And I'll give you a very specific, famous example of that in the Rumble in the Jungle, um, where uh, Muhammad Ali fought George Foreman. Uh, George Foreman was a bigger, stronger fighter, and Ali kept whispering in his ear, uh, saying, Is that all you've got, George? And he was trying to provoke him and make him angry mm -hmm. because he thought, The way I'm going to beat this guy, his big weakness is his anger. Mm -hmm. Like people think anger is a strength often. And Ali thought, anger is this guy's weakness as a boxer. If I make him angry, he's going to tire himself out and keep dropping his guard. And that's the only way, really, that I'm going to successfully beat him. If he keeps his cool, he'll beat me. But if I can provoke him into becoming angry, he actually becomes weak. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And he, so Ali won the fight. Yeah, I, I, I think that's where the Taoist, for example, right? So they also like this flow and you know, be like water and all that, so not resist life. Uh, but also they have Kung Fu, right? So they have uh, martial arts because they do not get angry, you know, but they need uh, to know how to fight. I think that's a very important point. Uh, the, the Stoics, when they criticize anger, it's not about suppressing anger, right? It is more like in time uh, becoming a person who doesn't need to get angry so it is becoming a person uh, who doesn't have anger in his or her life rather than just right now i'm angry and i'm suppressing it oh that, well, okay that's a really interesting technical point there about philosophy that i'd like to touch on and psychology this is a good point for us to discuss actually in our, our little group here so one of the things the stoics reject is plato's uh, tripartite model of the soul mm -hmm. like and, uh, and arguably, this is one of the differences between Plato and Socrates. So one of the big, uh, the, the, the Socratic problem in a way is how do we separate Socrates from Plato? Like, and many people will say, well, the theory of forms looks like a, a Plato. So actually, Aristotle tells us that it was Plato that developed the theory of forms and that's uh, being put in Socrates' mouth. But also this kind of tripartite model of the soul, which in a sense kind of influences folk psychology today. So we talk about reason and the passions mm -hmm. as if they're two separate things, right? But that's not necessarily accurate or true. And the Stoics, people thought, were doing something quite strange by saying that the passions are in a sense, uh, based on reason. They're cognitive in nature. Cognitive therapy does the same thing today. It's based on a thing called the cognitive theory of emotion, which is influenced by stoicism. So many people at first find this a hard idea because the way we talk about emotions, the, the way we talk about our minds in general, because we can't see the mind, we can carve it up any way we like, right? But sometimes we carve it up in a very unhelpful and inaccurate way. Like, so we, we kind of get to run amok, like defining uh, our mental faculties, you know, but maybe we're not doing it in a good way. So people typically say that there's reason on the one hand, and then there's desires and emotion on the other hand, and they're like two separate things. The Stoic said that's wrong. Like, and all of our emotions are based on thinking and cognitive psychology today supports that to a large extent. Um, and that, Really, the, the founder of cognitive therapy, Albert Ellis, put it very simply. Clients would come into therapy and they'd say, I'm angry, I'm anxious, I'm depressed, and it's causing me lots of problems. It's affecting my relationship, it's affecting my work. So in doing that, they'll be giving themselves a lot of reasons to change that. But then they'll express stuckness. They'll say, I know it's wrong, I know it's unhealthy, I know it's irrational, but I can't help it. It's just how I feel. And that's an expression of stuckness. And then Ellis would lean forward and say, but it's not just how you feel, is it? It's also how you think. That's a cognitive model of emotion. And they'd say, what do you mean? 
And he'd say, well, these feelings don't come from nowhere. They're based on underlying beliefs and value judgments. And once you acknowledge that, it opens up a toolbox of cognitive therapy techniques. Because you can say, well, what's the evidence for the underlying belief? So you're anxious. You know, that's typically because you believe something catastrophic is about to happen imminently and you won't be able to cope with it, is the typical cognitive model of anxiety. Uh, the model of anger, with some exceptions, is that you believe that somebody has done something they shouldn't have done and they deserve to be punished for it. Like, so it's, this, the Stoics rightly said anger, and other ancient thinkers said anger is kind of tied up with beliefs about revenge. In many cases, are inflicting harm on someone as punishment for a transgression of some assumed rule. Now, that might not fit every instance of anger, but it certainly it fits many instances of anger. But once you identify what the cognitive basis is, you can go, but is that actually true? Like, has the person done the thing that you think that they did? And is it as bad as you think that it is? Like, and is this rule even rational in the first place? So it opens up this toolbox, a philosophical toolbox, a, a rational toolbox, a logical toolbox that allows us to question inconsistencies, um, whether something is counterfactual, whether there might be a more adaptive or helpful alternative way of thinking about the situation. And when those beliefs change, then the feelings and desires typically change that, that uh, are associated with them. And Socrates knew that, and the, and the Stoics really emphasize it. And, and that's why we owe cognitive therapy uh, to this insight from the, the Stoics. And so uh, right now we have some questions, not that much, I think, but uh, if you are okay with it, uh, since we are already passing one and hour, one and a half hour mark, uh, if you are okay with it, Just 10 minutes might be enough, I guess. That sounds good. Okay. Uh, so uh, someone asked, uh, is there an association between uh, being happy and being virtuous? Can we say that if we, if we are virtuous enough, then we will be happy? I, I think that is uh, a very uh, common misunderstanding of the stoic views on uh, happiness. So it, it, it might be good to address it. I think it's a it's a tricky question, actually. Mm. So first of all, I I believe that happiness is a mistranslation of eudaimonia, mm -hmm. and it seems to me that the word eudaimonia, which is a strange word in Greek, like it's a it's a slightly odd word. Um, it seems to me that the the main definition that the ancient authors give of eudaimonia is it's the condition of someone who's living the good life or the best possible life. And so it doesn't really just mean a warm glow. Um, really, it refers to someone living in, um, in the optimum way for a human being. Or you could say a, a better translation would be fulfillment or flourishing, for example. It means living well would be a, a better way of putting it than, than happiness. Now, in the English language, the word happiness actually originally had a different meaning as well. So the word happy, happy originally meant fortunate um, or also meant flourishing. And it's only over time, again, like we said about Epicureanism and Stoicism, these words, the meaning became degraded over time. This is true of the word happiness. Yeah. That um, and In English, we also still have the antonym. We have the opposite word, which is hapless. So we use hapless to mean somebody who's wretched or unfortunate, the opposite of flourishing. And happy originally meant the opposite of that. It meant somebody who's doing well and flourishing. But somehow, over time, we, we, we degraded it into the meaning, like the feeling you get when you eat chocolate or something like that, right? Like this kind uh, of... I think utilitarians are at fault about that. <laughs> yeah. So what do we mean by happiness? Um, if happiness means flourishing and doing well then for the Stoics, it's almost definitional that living in accord with the virtues would be uh, synonymous with flourishing. Does that give you a warm glow of the kind that you get when you eat chocolate or something like that? Not necessarily. You know, it might give you positive feelings. Um, and, and, like, and in many cases, it probably does, but not always. And the Stoics acknowledge that this is problematic. So, for example, Seneca points to things like um, in the heat of battle, Uh, or in a, we might say in a crisis or a high stress situation, 
you, you don't have time uh, necessarily to bask in the, uh, the warm glow that you get from uh, acting virtuously. You, you have to act virtuously because it's an end in itself. Um, and this would be true of many other situations in life. Also, those feelings are variable. They vary from one person to another. They might vary depending on what's going on in your, your blood chemistry at the time. So, you, you know, they're a bad, they're a poor or unreliable guide to action. And this is a big theme in modern psychotherapy. Psychotherapy shifted in the last 10 or 15 years into what we call a third wave of modern psychotherapy, third wave of CBT, which radically questions the emphasis placed on subjective feelings as a guide to life in older modes of self-help and psychotherapy. And actually modern psychotherapy places more emphasis on living in accord with our values. And one of the places where that's become central is in the treatment of clinical depression. So we know that we used to think that people who are depressed don't engage in enough pleasurable activities. And then researchers realized that wasn't quite right. And that, that depression has more to do with people not engaging in meaningful activities or fulfilling activities. And actually people who are depressed often do a lot of things that they consider pleasurable. So they take drugs and they lie in bed and they binge watch Netflix and they eat lots of chocolate. And, and, and often they're very driven to do comforting, pleasurable things. Um, but that deprives them of a more fundamental eudaimonistic feeling of satisfaction or fulfillment, um, which is more subtle, you know, but more existential, you know, like more, more nuanced, more um, a deeper, uh, you know, kind of experience. And so you could say maybe, you know, one of the problems we run into is people confusing these superficial pleasures with this deeper, more subtle sense of satisfaction uh, or awareness that we're on the right track in life. I, I would compare it to being able to look at yourself and nod in approval, if you like. You know, that, I think that's what the Stoics are driving at. Like what we're missing when we're depressed is the ability to look in the mirror and be satisfied with what we see. Um, you know, we might be stuffing chocolates and watching Netflix and we look in the mirror and feel very disappointed with what we see because it's completely out of kilter with our, our, our most fundamental values. And so modern behavior therapy for depression is all about clarifying our core values and re-designing um, our daily routines so it's somewhat more in accord with those values. So it, certainly it seems to be the key to treating depression to act in accord with values or acting virtuously. Um, but that's a little bit different from saying that it makes us feel happy in the sort of superficial modern sense of the word. So, so it is an ambiguous term, but so happiness is an ambiguous term, but maybe we can say, um, I'm happy with this pencil, right? It writes, yeah. so maybe for Stoics, if you're a virtuous person, then you are happy with your life. I like that. That's a good way of putting it, yeah. You're happy with the sort of person that you've become. Yeah. Maybe another way of putting it, I think. Happy with your character, perhaps. Yeah, you know? yeah. So I'm uh, looking at other uh, questions. Uh, there's a very long one. Uh, I think internalizing the idea of stoicism can be effective for treatment of uh, psychosis. Can it be applied to uh, those pa uh, patients? Uh, she has some Freudian uh stuff before uh, according to freud people are psychotic because their egos cannot suppress the desires of it and allow it to separate them from part of reality i think internal internalizing the idea of stoicism can be effective for treatment of psychosis can it be applied to those patients uh, what what she means by those i am not sure Psychotic patients. I'm going to give a very short answer to that, which is treatment of psychosis would be outside my sphere of competence as a psychotherapist, so I wouldn't normally comment on that. Um, I don't. The Freudian model of psychosis, I think, is, is pre-scientific. Um, so what it lacks is an evidence base. Mind you, so does Stoic Stoicism is not evidence based, but arguably Stoicism is more consistent with what evidence based psychology teaches us. I think uh, Freudianism. And, you know, apologies if, you, if you're a Freudian and you're offended by this. But I, I see Freudianism as, as, as being really a, a pseudoscience 
to a large extent, although there might be aspects of it that are, are relevant today. Could internalizing stoicism benefit psychotic patients? I'm not really sure. Um, psychotic patients don't benefit as much from conventional cognitive therapy, that's for sure. Although in some cases, um, it may be that, that cognitive therapy could play a role in the treatment of certain forms of psychosis. And therefore, I suppose stoicism could be an adjunct to that. But I, I, I don't think, I think it's unlikely that in many cases, stoicism alone could be like a, a kind of cure or a treatment for psychosis. But um, I'd refer that question to somebody who specializes in, in treating uh, those type of conditions. Uh, uh, so I might add, another uh, more philosophical uh, question about that. For example, uh, do you think uh, a sociopath can uh, have a eudaimonic life uh, according to a stoic philosophical view? Because uh, it seems to me that they necessarily lack some pro-social virtues due to some conditions uh, not, in, uh, not due to themselves. So that's a very difficult question. Um, uh, I think that might uh, add some sort of uh, luck to uh, stoicism yeah. and uh, some Aristotelian fortune uh, that is necessary for uh, having a eudaimonic life. And it's not entirely up to us. I, I would, it's a hard question. Um, so in a way, we're talking about people whose brains perhaps in, intrinsically f are wired differently or function differently, perhaps. And then that would lead into questions like, well, well like, then what would it mean for the Stoics to say that a, a, like an animal um, is flourishing? What would it mean for them to say that the, the sage is flourishing? And are there humans who are unlike the sage in, in some respects in terms of the constitution of their brain and their actual nature? What would the implications of that be for how we'd conceptualize virtue for them? So I suppose what the Stoics might say is that even if you're a sociopath, you do possess reason, although you may lack um, certain aspects of empathy or certain aspects of your emotional life. And I think the Stoics would want to say, look, if you're a sociopath and you're acting consistently in accord with reason, you should nevertheless end up behaving like somebody who has a conscience even if you lack the, the, the feelings that, that go along with it. Although, you know, maybe it would be, um, it's going to be more problematic. It's going to be more difficult for you to behave consistently in accord with those moral principles. But as long as you're employing reason, you should be able to, uh, to, to apply it consistently to your relationships in a way that would make you resemble the sage. I think that maybe perhaps... Um, but, but they have the so a psychopath has the rational nature. But that, does the psychopath have the does the psychopath have the, the social nature? Would we say they? So I'm not very sure about what that consists in the social nature. Is it? Well, they may lack a social conscience uh -huh. uh, and may find may have difficulty empathizing with other people. Um, one last question, I think. Um, he he. In, one people, one person says that, why can't I ignore things that come from external world, even though I know that they are not under my control? Knowing that they are not under my control does not solve my problems. I think uh, he wants some more of a practical side of uh, advice, not philosophical. Well, the stories give us lots of psychological techniques. And the first book I wrote about stoicism, I listed 18 psychological strategies that I could find in the, in the stoic writings, right? So there's loads, like, mm. it's quite impressive. And uh, I've got, I can mention a couple. Um, so like focusing on the fact that something is out of our control, in many cases, actually, Descartes really is emphatic about that idea that he believes if you really uh, accept and really grasp that something's outside of your control, then it, he, Descartes thought that was the key to mastering your emotions in the discourse on method. Um, but there are other things that the Stoics do. So when we, um, one would just be this whole question of how much value we place on external things. So the Stoics would encourage us uh, to question that philosophically. Another thing would be thinking about the consequences of placing that much value on external things. So the Stoics say to us, for example, 
imagine each morning if you continue to get upset about those things and place that much value on them what the consequences of that would be today and tomorrow and further down the line into the future and then what would happen if you viewed those things in a more detached way and you exercised moderation and self-discipline or endurance towards them um, you responded more rationally and wisely what would the consequence of that be in contrast to the day tomorrow and the day after and so I have to be kind of concise about this, but really, the, because there's a, I could talk all day about these techniques. But really, what you're doing there is two things. You're envisaging the longer term consequences of a course of action, and you're contrasting two uh, different courses of action. And those are both complementary strategies for enhancing our motivation to follow one rather than the other. So th those two techniques, if you can learn to do them properly, are actually very powerful ways of increasing motivation for changing behavior. And uh, another thing that we know um, is that when people become emotionally distressed, they, we, we are capable of, you know, in recent decades, psychologists more and more have studied attention. And uh, you can pay attention to several things at once. And attention can be broad or narrow, um, it can be more flexible or mobile, or it can be rigidly fixed on things. It can also vary sometimes as to whether our attention is under voluntary control or whether it's hijacked um, and it, it becomes more automatic. So when people are upset, they tend to narrow their field of attention and like they're putting things that upset them under a magnifying glass. So it's no coincidence that the Stoics think we should do exercises like the view from above. And a number of the other stoic exercises also involve broadening our chronological or spatial sense of awareness. Mm -hmm. So the stoics realized, because they were really smart and way ahead of their time like this, that when we are able to make our attention broader and more flexible, it kind of dilutes the emotional impact that things had on us. And we, we didn't really get around to talking about stoic pantheism, but the stoics kind of believed that the reality is the, the bigger picture of the whole. And they thought that in a sense, whenever we take any individual thing out of, uh, on its own and we ignore the bigger picture, when we narrow down on it too much, we're kind of committing a lie of omission. We're taking things out of context in a, say, in a sense. And in court in Britain, you swear an oath in the Bible to tell the truth, the whole truth and nothing but the truth, because the legal system recognizes that telling a partial or incomplete truth is a form of lying, it's a lie of omission. And the Stoics as pantheists think that by our very nature, we're constantly committing lies of omission to ourselves. Why? Because we look at individual events and take them out of their uh, bigger context, uh, the historical context or the context in our, our life story. So my girlfriend's just broken up with me, you might say, and get really, really upset about that. But maybe in the longer term, you know, weeks, months from now, you'll meet somebody else and have another relationship and it might be better than that one. I, you know, I got sacked from my job, but maybe I'll go on to start a business and I'd be better off than I would be if I stayed in my job. So by looking at the bigger picture chronologically and also expanding our spatial perspective, we, you know, we can dilute the emotional attachment and the, the level of intensity of our desires and emotions in a, ration, in a way that the books would say is actually more rational. Mm -hmm. Um. Tufano Jam, if you have anything to add, uh, we can end the live stream. Yeah, we can, we can. Uh, uh, th uh, thanks uh, a lot for uh, Don Robertson and Tufan Kimas. Uh, we are here uh, on Öncül. And thanks a lot for uh, everyone who listened to this live stream. Uh, hopefully, uh, see you on the next live streams. Bye. Thank you very much. Thank, Thank you. you. Bye. Okay.